Topbird Talk. My name's Ronan Aston. I'm a uh, clinical uh, consultant in respiratory medicine with a particular interest in breathlessness and its cause and treatment. Um, I also have a research interest in the same area. Um, but in my clinical life, I'm particularly interested in uh, how we better diagnose causes of breathlessness with the aim of introducing treatments at an earlier time point so that patients receive benefit and ultimately improve their symptoms. Ronan, what breathlessness is one of those things that must be a, a little bit of a nightmare when it persists for the general practitioners. When they do see a patient with breathlessness, what's the point at which they refer to these new specialist services? And we'll get into exactly what you provide. The system as it currently stands is that patients can be referred with breathlessness to various different specialties, predominantly um, respiratory and cardiology, but they'll also present to their GPs and other physicians. Um, and those physicians then will conduct a series of investigations over a time course that can vary from months to even years. And often it's the case that only once negative results are gained from those various studies will they be referred to a specialist service. And the consequence of that is that patients um, often find themselves waiting for long periods in between tests and for long periods thereafter for referral to a special centre that might provide a diagnosis. It has a knock-on effect for the NHS in terms of the cost of those repeat uh, appointments and often repeat investigations. So there's a benefit to be sought for both the patient and the health service in providing more coordinated service over a shorter time frame for these patients. So I'm just going to back you up a second there, Roland. So if somebody presents their general practitioner with breathlessness they obviously take a history do a basic uh, examination you know listen to the chest listen to the lungs listen to the heart now traditionally uh, that would head them off down a single speciality referral i think is what you're telling me so that's right no 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 heart murmur it uh, sounds like it's probably their lungs lungs not quite right go see lung specialist is, is that the yes yeah. yeah exactly and there'll also be those patients that they can diagnose in primary care so of course there'll be many patients presenting with asthma for instance that can be diagnosed and dealt with in primary care so what the, the primary physician gp is trying to do is, is weed out the cases that they can't make a safe diagnosis in and then decide who to refer to but as you say in the system I stands they have to decide between somebody specialized in cardiac medicine versus respiratory medicine versus other and let's for example say they overtly seem to have heart failure or they had a, 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 what we call a medical student murmur nothing against that mm. gp colleagues here but there's a <laughs> there's a howling murmur there for example that explained the condition then the primary referral would be to into cardiology for example that's right yeah but but the challenge is it's very rarely black and white it's usually very many shades of gray Exactly. So and your service pulls together in a one-stop shop, is that right, that, that checks off all those boxes quite quickly? What our aim is, is to, rather than look at the scenario with a single medical hat on of respiratory or cardiology, to rather look at the symptom itself, the breathlessness, and then look at the, all the possible causes from the off using a system of investigations that allows us to make a diagnosis at the earliest point and then institute treatment at the earliest point, whether that be for cardiology, respiratory or other cause. And you do holistic tests in there, like um, the sort of things we see athletes doing, exercise tests that help to pick apart these various different parts if the first round of investigations yeah, isn't obvious? Well, exactly. So exercise testing for us is, is one of the most powerful tests um, because it joins up all those different specialties in a single test. So we use exercise testing at a much earlier time point than perhaps would be traditionally performed, and it can be extremely useful in trying to delineate the cardiac from the respiratory, from the breathing control, and, and more psychological uh, causes of breathlessness. Now how, how accessible are these clinics now, Rona? Is yours unusual? You're at University College London Hospitals. Is that an unusual one, That's or are right. they popping up all over the place? Well, there's, a, there's an increasing understanding that the current services aren't uh, meeting patient needs and service needs. Um, there's also an increasing interest in, uh, in breathlessness as a, as a specific sort of specialty or at least interest area. So we're finding that there are services uh, being, being set up, certainly around London um, and elsewhere in the country, but... Uh, many of the big teaching hospitals now understand that these kind of services provide quite a unique 
a very useful um, uh, service for a, a considerable patient group. So take, take, I'll take you back to my original scenario. So let's imagine I'm out there as a GP now, and I've done my history, I've performed my basic examination, and it seems barn door to me that the problem here is a, is a basic lung problem. Should I still primarily refer to the lung and the same for the cardiology let's imagine there's that there is the barn door murmur i believe you know which is gets mm. difficult in the elderly do, do i still point towards you or do i go down the traditional routes first well it depends i mean it, it, the various clinics have different referral criteria and that's really based around their local population because local population does have uh, significance in terms of the caseload that you're going to be meeting and there's also differences in the different in the various service in terms of the specialties they have on site in our service we will accept all referrals with breathlessness but we do have a criteria that they have to have had breathlessness for at least six weeks and that time frame varies from service to service and that's an attempt to uh, avoid the simple cause of breathlessness which will be treated and recover quickly uh, such as chest infections or viral upper respiratory tract infections for instance if there is still a need and a role for the very specialist clinics they can be referred too quickly for instance the rapid access chest pain clinic is a very well designed service that shouldn't really be replicated in our service because they have very easy access to the specialist cardiac investigations which are very important to be conducted in a very short time frame. That said, our service is designed so that if we are referred a patient with a clear cardiac cause, they will be referred very quickly into a specialist cardiac service. Now one of our shared interests is aortic stenosis, the narrowing of the main vessel out from the heart, the aorta, which occurs in many patients over time, but sometimes can occur critically and in a life-threatening way. Now, I understand one of the challenges there is as patients get older, it's not unusual to have a murmur that sounds like it might be a problem with the aortic valve. Is that still the case? That's right, yeah. And where do we stand with regards to echocardiography to look at that valve out in the community? Is is that happening more commonly now or is that still a specialist referral? We're still seeing that as a specialist referral. There may well be echo services elsewhere, but almost all cases in our hospital are referred without previous echo. The echo service, therefore, has grown and is easily accessed, certainly from secondary care. GPs are increasingly able to refer, but we're not quite seeing that yet in our service. I think that varies quite a lot from district to district. Just going to bring in Nick now. We'll call, we'll call him Nick the patient, because that's how we, one of the ways we use Nick yeah. here. Nick, what, what are you making of this? <laughs> well, I'm... I'm wondering if you can tell me what you think the disadvantages of this are. From a, if it, are there any from a patient point of view? Do you see what I'm saying? What, what would be the things that I might? Well, I you're might, worried that you might be put through the ringer for no good reason. Yeah. What would be the things that, as a patient, you know, not knowing anything about it, that I might initially sort of suspect weren't so good. Well, I think everyone's slightly different in terms of the way they tackle their own symptoms and uh, and their thoughts around that. So for some patients, the prospect of, of having multiple investigations in a short time frame can be quite daunting. Yeah. Um, certainly when studies are done on the same day as investigations, results are provided. Although on the medical side, we think that's a great service for some patients that there's too much information in one sitting. So we have to be mindful of that. Um, And within our service, we also have uh, provision for the psychological assessment and treatment even of of the breathing control aspects. So we do have an awareness and understanding that the thoughts around breathlessness are often quite prominent in both the symptomatology and also the treatment of that. Hmm. So, Nick, have you got a good handle? You've maybe not seen it in yourself, but maybe with some of your loved ones. Yeah. Is the way we quite often work is we turn around and the GP's done their very, very best, you know, and they say, think might be your lungs, lung appointment, Hmm. maybe four weeks, maybe six weeks, not lungs, come back, oh, maybe heart, heart appointment, and so that ping pong can go on until until you hit the target. Would you rather have that, or would you rather go and see the experts once? I don't. Business? This is what I'm trying to understand because for me, if I had breathing difficulties, it's like we said, bef- yeah. we were saying before, I would think, right, I want to see a lung specialist. 
and it's the end of that. I wouldn't, oh. you know, I wouldn't process it much further than that. I think. So, so Ronan, and that's, uh, yeah, go for um, that. um, I guess that's the, the challenge of, of medicine because whilst it might seem quite obviously a lung issue it might actually be a cardiac cause or another cause um and that's where gps are are very skilled and i would not want to belittle their their skill in this area at all because they are very good at trying trying to weed out one system from another and this is one of the disadvantages i imagine in a health system where you can choose which physician you you attend because the most obvious isn't always the correct one and second to that there is undoubtedly the issue of if you are referred to see a specialist because of their bias towards a specialism subconsciously or otherwise they may be less aware of the alternative diagnoses for instance if you get referred to a cardiac specialist they will probably first consider the cardiac causes rather than taking an overall view of the possible causes of that symptom mm. Mm. Uh, Ronan of the uh, of the patients where you rapidly make a definitive diagnosis where you can do something let's call it curative we know what i mean here something yeah. that's really going to change their life what what sort of percentage fall into that categories and what what things are high up on that list what's the kind of great day at the office where you say kaboying here we go off to this specialist problem fixed so we have a, a tiered um investigation protocol and that's an attempt to not waste money and not waste patient time or effort in undergoing investigations that aren't definitely necessary. And we find that in the first tier, so that's investigations done prior to being seen in clinic or just at or soon after the first clinic, we can make diagnoses in approximately a third of the patients. Those diagnoses are often the airways diseases like asthma or COPD or something obviously cardiac, so a, a murmur of significance. Then the second tier of investigations, which usually includes the cardiopulmonary exercise test and maybe a specialised cardiac test, will diagnose a further third of patients or so, and they will be diagnosing cardiac causes, other bre- uh, breathing causes predominantly. It takes other specialist investigations, so a third tier of investigations, to diagnose the remaining third. Within those diagnoses, we institute a treatment trial at the earliest opportunity so that the patient hopefully is finding benefit from our supposed diagnosis at an earlier time point. And, and uh, again, back to one of our shared interests being this aortic stenosis thing, as the technology is mm. developed, if you do happen to fall into that category, I don't want to under, play down it, but they can pop a new valve in via your groin now if you're lucky enough to be uh, a- appropriate for that type of approach. That's right, and and the services, certainly the service that we refer to, has a very quick referral time and referral process, so that if a valve is needed, it can be it can be placed in a, in a short time frame nowadays. Part of the research that we're involved is in, is trying to understand uh, what sort of period of time might be ideal to get that valve back in. That's right, because in in days gone by, or, or even now there is a tendency to wait until symptoms are significant before replacing that valve Um, our interest is whether we can time that intervention better so that their recovery from the surgery uh, minimal surgery as it is is quicker and better because there's that uh, that worry that patients who are waiting a while without getting enough blood to their muscles, their muscles might be wasting and they might be getting other problems as a result of the wait. I know Johnny wants to come in with a question. Johnny's a, another one of our patients for the purpose of this discussion. Hi. Um, Hi so, so we've recently had a, a bit of an experience in my family with my mother having a period of getting more and more breathless over the period, I suppose, of a about two to three years um, it transpires right. and she didn't want to complain because you know you get more breathless as you get older what what mm. what i'm interested in knowing is, is what what more can be done at the early stage you mentioned about early detection what, what could we do in the sort of community or in primary health care system to try and pick these things up earlier so people are kind of treating these things earlier she's 84 and i think she'd have bounced back much quicker if she'd been picked up earlier yeah and i think i think there's um two aspects of this one is the awareness and that's probably awareness on the health professional side as much as the patient side. I think there is a tendency to accept symptoms 
in older age that are actually due to pathology rather than just the physiology of getting older. And, and that requires education uh, of the primary care physicians and also secondary care physicians. And, and we're doing that uh, gradually in going out, meeting and chatting to the, the GPs in the area. For patients, I think there, I hope there is a gradually improving awareness in our communities of symptoms. And that goes hand in hand with more nationwide drives run by places like the British Lung Foundation um, about lung health. In terms of practical things that can be done, um, GPs have good access to spirometry and in performing simple spirometry you can identify fairly quickly whether there's a pathology certainly of the airways and lungs and that should instigate a, a referral to secondary care unless they are happy with the diagnosis from their first investigation. But is it reasonable to conclude Ronan that uh, when you get to a particular age you shouldn't assume that your breathlessness is just because you've got to a particular age it's always worth having well, that's right. I mean, I think, I mean our message in, in our clinic is that it's rare for physiology so just getting older to cause over breathlessness there's almost certainly something else pathological going on um, other than just getting older and that's brought out in, in, our, in our work and our experience as well so I, I'd always encourage further investigation, even if it is just simple spirometry, um, to reassure the patient and the physician that there is nothing else going on. And the spirometry is the blowing into a machine test that you can do at the... Yeah, exactly. Blowing into the machine, which is which is now available in uh, either in the GP surgery or in community centres, uh, can be provided and can be uh, can be conducted with great reproducibility and validity. So, so an easily accessed test. Now, of course, that's concentrating a lot on on the respiratory system, um, and we've already said in this conversation that it's not just about the lungs. Yeah. So there's the cardiac side of things as well that has to be considered. Is it still worth listening to the heart, or? Is that still worth still worth listening to the heart? Um, I guess as, as much as the first investigation of breathlessness is listening to the lungs and doing spirometry, I think in, a, in the, the community or in the first assessment, listening to the heart can still give you some useful information. If done more prevalently, I'm sure we'd get some additional cases. Let's be honest now. In the hospital, we used to wear a stethoscope as our sort of necklace indicating, ooh, look at me, I'm the doctor. Uh, <laughs> And then infection control said you can't have your own fancy Lippmann stethoscope. Are we de-skilling on that front? Do, do, we, do we tend to go... Well, yeah, so I'll put my hands up and say I, I still walk around with a stethoscope, obviously cleaning between patients, but that's <laughs> rather than as a, as a trophy. It's you more are, because I, I do use doctor. it. Yeah, you're a lung doctor. You're the real deal. Well, yeah, so. and I do, and I, but I agree with your second point. I think we are uh, losing this skill in in auscultation and, and listening to, to signs i think they're still useful and both in both the respiratory and the cardiac causes of, of breathlessness uh, and i always encourage my juniors and medical students to continue their their learning in terms of recognizing sounds of disease in both those systems so i'm a, a big proponent of the stethoscope as much as i also appreciate the uh, the advantages of echocardi- echocardiography and, and high-intensity imaging. So we've kept you a lot longer than I promised, Ronan, but I, I used to do a reasonable interpretation or a, a reasonable impersonation of a mitral valve prolapse. How, how's your... Your, your murmur. <laughs> Just, so before we, no, can, well. <laughs> it's only because only I didn't win the medicine prize viva because I got it wrong. I was stuck. <laughs> the, um, J- J- Johnny, any uh, your mum. Mm-hmm. Do, do, was, did, what, which, what did it turn out to be in the end? The lung, the heart, something else? A heart. It was a tri-something block. Triphysicular. Triphysicular yeah. block, yeah. So, so she, she knew a wire sorted out? Yeah, so she had a, um, she had a pacemaker put in. Um, they reckon that she'd been probably walking around with a heart rate of about 25 to 30 for several months. Oh. Um, mm. Doing well now? Yeah, she's bouncing back well, but uh, um, yeah, yeah, she but, didn't. She didn't complain. But you're niggling about the fact that if you'd got her there earlier, she might have. Yeah, I think a lot of the blame's with her on that. But mm. I think it's, it's, a, it's awareness there. But you know, similarly, she was seeing healthcare professionals that didn't take a pulse, that didn't okay. didn't use a stethoscope. Yeah. So, so this isn't going out for general consumption. So let's blame your mum, Johnny. So. <laughs> <laughs> Ronan, uh, anything? Sorry, we've kept you a lot longer than we promised. Anything else to, to to add? If people want to come to your wonderful service, what's the route in? So referral for my service, referral to UCLH uh, Thoracic Medicine, and they will be referred into my service, uh, usually within uh, four weeks 
um, sometimes longer six weeks, but rarely. Um, and if patients live elsewhere in London, like I say, there are services in most of the teaching hospitals now that can be accessed via GP referrals. Great. Well, we'll put some literature and some links into the uh, the website that goes with this. So, Ronan Aston, uh, University College London Hospital, thank you very much indeed, and congratulations on your excellent work helping people who are breathless. Thank you. Thank you. Top Bed Talk. Dan, Dan Martin, I'm an anaesthetist uh, at the Royal Free Hospital. Um, uh, I do intensive care medicine, and we run uh, a cardiopulmonary exercise testing service uh, both there and at University College Hospital. So we were talking earlier to Ronan Aston, who's been part of setting up a breathlessness clinic at University College London Hospitals. Now, I, I think you at the Royal Free were into this earlier, and, and that's the sort of service that you're referring to. Uh, yes, we, for about the past uh, year, 18 months now, we've been running um, uh, a clinic primarily for patients with unexplained breathlessness. So uh, a patient might perhaps go to their general practitioner and um, uh, have a problem with breathlessness and and they can get uh, referred directly to us now Um, and one of the things we do is we have a sort of virtual clinic so the patients that are referred are um, discussed uh, amongst a group of us sort of multidisciplinary team and we try to work out what it is they may need before they've even come into the hospital uh, to prevent them coming in for sort of unnecessary investigations and uh, appointments with various doctors. Okay, so if if the, the examples we were talking about with Ronan, big picture stuff, was it yeah. it, it seems to obviously be the lungs, I everything yeah. is suggesting, including the examination done by the GP, that this is a lung issue, that there's still a route into the lung doctors, and if it is seems to be barned or obvious, like a raging murmur, for example, uh, uh, via chest examination with a the stethoscope, then the route still could be into the cardiologists off the bat. Is, is that right? Is it? It's when... It's when it's not black and white that the, the, the breathlessness clinic gets in the grey zone. That's right. Um, so uh, ho- we hope that sort of people have been screened out for other clinics before they get to us. Uh, but this is why we discuss all the patients uh, up front before we invite them into the hospital, just in case there's anything really obvious from the, the history that we see that, that, as you say, would perhaps indicate that this was a very uh, clear indication to go and see a respiratory doctor or a cardiology doctor. So we're really teasing out um, the the referrals, which there seems to be no obvious cause from the information that we already have and may need a bit of further investigation uh, from us. And when you do the further investigation, part of Mm. that, you said, was this cardiopulmonary exercise test, because I'm sure some people would have turned around and said, hang on, I thought he just said he's an an anesthesia doctor and an intensive care doctor. What are they doing this? Uh, yes, quite confusing for some people to, to, to make that link. Um, but uh, so uh, what we've chosen to do is to put cardiopulmonary exercise testing as one of our first line tests now. Uh, and we've got quite a lot of data from the last 18 months to show uh, that this, uh, this leads to a diagnosis in the majority of our cases without any further investigations required. Um, and it saves a lot of um, unnecessary time for the patients coming in and out and having various other tests where we can we can often get to the root cause with the cardiopulmonary exercise test and um, it, it is a bit unusual that uh, so I'm an anaesthetist uh, helping to, to run that side of the service but it's uh, traditionally we've been providing that service for patients having surgery to, to make some sort of uh, estimation of how they may uh, fare having ma- major surgery Uh, And and from that, we've um, developed this diagnostic service. So using the cardiopulmonary exercise testing uh, with a little more uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, looking deeper into the data, if you like, uh, than we do for the surgical patients to see if we can find a diagnosis within the sort of subtle changes that we see on the test. So the patient is put on uh, an exercise bicycle like one might see in a, a gym, a uh, standing bike with a tight-fitting mask and some ECG electrodes on, and then they're asked to cycle up a, um, a hill, basically created by the machinery within the bike. Is that, is that right? And then, and then you do lots of clever measures to say, is it the lungs, is it the heart? Absolutely, yeah. So it, the test is exactly as you um, described, uh, and we have a, a very skilled um, exercise physiologist with them who, who can often also pick up other 
sort of subtleties of, of how the patient uh, is doing uh, on the tests because it's not um, it's, it's, it's worth saying it's not only uh, physiological and pathological problems that we find uh, with these patients for for a proportion of them there are some psychological problems uh, which is often tied in with uh, breathlessness which which uh, sort of uh, our, our physiologists can can help to um, pick up uh, when the patients are doing the tests so sometimes it's a sense of the fact that you're not getting enough air oxygen into the body, but in reality it's a it's a sensation, a bit like a sort of chronic pain type of thing, as opposed to the lack of oxygen. Absolutely, and I mean the, the, the test is is great for that because what we, we what we can do often is see that there's no pathology on the results of the test. So the patient actually does reasonably well, but you can see that they have a very abnormal response. Um, to exercising with, with very high rates of breathing often, but, but not in a physiological or pathological way uh, at, at all. And we, we have a psychologist um, as part of our team at the Royal Free Hospital, so we can make a very quick referral uh, to the psychologist. Uh, and we've had some great results with the counselling that they can provide for this sensation, as you describe, of, of feeling breathless, which is not actually in reality a, a sort of pathological cause to, to being short of breath or or suffering from a low oxygen level. So, so Dan, one of the specialist interests of this podcast series is is whether the heart valves are sometimes the problem. Now, now how often, if at all, do you detect heart valve problems despite the screening? Um, I would say uh, that we, uh, the, the, the cardiologists are, are pick up uh, the majority of the heart valve uh, problems, but we, uh, we do have patients coming through who we have suspicion that there may a bit, maybe a primary pathology with their heart that's not been picked up on other tests previously, um, and, and we would then refer them back to the cardiologist to say, look, actually we think you need to look at this patient a bit further because there's something not quite right about this test. The lungs are all fine, but our uh, measures that we're taking would suggest this to be a cardiology problem rather than a respiratory problem. And most of those people who are detected with heart valve problems who go straight to the cardiologist, is, this, is the good old-fashioned stethoscope and listening to the chest still the, the primary weapon for that? Uh, I, I think, certainly I think it's the, the first way in which things are picked up. Uh, I think that a lot of people with breathlessness that we see who've been investigated by the cardiologist, that they'll have used the stethoscope, see what they can hear, uh, and then one of their first go-to tests would be an echocardiogram to see uh, whether or not there are any problems with the, with the squeezing or the function of the heart muscle uh, and any problem with the valves themselves. And if the cardiologist looks and the heart valve is not completely normal but they don't think it's bad enough to cause the problems, do they still, can they still loop back to you to say, could you now put that together with the lungs and, and other problems that might be driving this breathlessness because they seem too breathless? Mm-hmm for what we're Absolutely. seeing yeah yeah because they, and sometimes patients have more than one pathology so that they, they may have picked up that there's a, a heart valve problem uh, and, and they might just say well that that's the cause of the blessed breathlessness but if they really feel that the, there's something else going on here uh, as well as the heart valve then the cardiopulmonary exercise test is a really useful test to be able to say well, well we, we know there's a problem with the valve but is there is there something else we're we're missing here uh, and sometimes they send us patients with very severe valvular problems uh, to try and determine whether or not now is the right time for these patients to have surgery to, to repair the problem with their valve. And one of the things we were discussing earlier is is age. So there's a tendency to think as you get older, you will inevitably get more breathless. But that's not what we were hearing from Ronan. We were hearing that the the default position should still be if you're getting more breathless irrespective of age, you should still try and understand it. I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, and we, we, uh, we've seen uh, quite a number of elderly patients uh, come through our clinic, uh, patients in their 80s and above, who uh, you might just say, well, this is your age, you, you are likely to be breathless. But, but I agree with Renzen that, that that's not the case. And it's all kind of relative to that individual. And if they say they've got an increased uh, breathlessness or at least sensation of breathlessness, that, that 
in our mind, needs investigating to make sure that we're not missing something important there. So for a wrap there, increasing breathlessness, irrespective of age, first port of call your GP, they'll do a fantastic job for you. If it's barned or obvious, one particular organ, off to those. But if you're in a mystery space, the new opportunity is the breathlessness clinic. Is that right, Dan? Absolutely. Uh, Very well put. (laughs) Well, Dan Martin, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. If people want to find your service, can uh, we look it up online at the Royal Free Hospital? Is it badged as a breathlessness clinic? Uh, yes, it's, uh, um, you'll, you'll find it there at the, on the Royal Free Hospital uh, website um, uh, and you'll be able to get more information from the website. Brilliant, Dan. Great to talk to you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Top Boot Talk.